Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on King Narmer. I'm your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to take an in-depth look at the king who many scholars think was the first to unify Upper and Lower Egypt. In doing so, we'll get an in-depth case study concerning the interpretation of archaeological artifacts, learning what they can tell us and where they leave us short. We'll also end up investigating one of the ongoing mysteries about early Egypt, whether Narmer is the same king that Manetho calls Menes, the first king of a unified Egypt. So if you're sick of being a measly regional ruler, or you're just looking to unify your country, journey with me as we investigate King Narmer, unifier of Egypt. In today's lecture, we'll take our first in-depth look at one of the individual kings of Egypt. But while this episode will mainly be focused on Narmer, we're going to start with someone else. A king that the Greco-Egyptian historian Manetho calls Menes. By the time Manetho was writing in the 3rd century BCE, the tale of Menes had already grown tall. Not only was he considered the unifier of Upper and Lower Egypt, he was frequently considered the first human ruler of Egypt after a long line of divine gods. Now, later Greek and Roman historians, they go even further. Diodorus Siculus, a Greek historian writing a couple hundred years after Manetho, claimed that Menes was the first to worship the gods, and that he even invented sacrifice itself. Pliny, a different Greco-Roman historian, writing in the 2nd century CE, claimed that Menes invented writing itself. But perhaps the craziest story comes from the priests of Sobek, the crocodile god. They ended up claiming that one day, while out hunting, Menes was attacked by his own dogs. He fled across a lake on the back of a crocodile to get away from them, and as uh, thank you. Afterwards, he founded Crocodileopolis, sacred to the god Sobek. Try saying that one three times fast. You'd think it'd be easy to confidently identify a person with such famed accomplishments. The early texts from the Old Kingdom, however, never mention anyone by the name of Menes, or anything like it. Usually the Greek names for kings are just slight variations based on the phonetics of the Egyptian originals. But in this case, we have nothing. Well, the problem here ends up coming down to Egyptian naming conventions. There wasn't just one name. The king had a birth name, often known as the Sej and B name. But the king also had a Horus name, the kingly name he took upon entering the position of Pharaoh. So think of something similar happening with like, um, like popes today, right? Uh, and scholars today think that Menes might have been the unifier's birth name, while Narmer was clearly a Horus name or a new kingly name. So if you're thinking, okay, this guy keeps saying that people with completely different names may actually be the same person. 
Well, what in the world is the evidence for that? Well, you're asking exactly the right questions. And the simple answer is that a lot of archaeological evidence clearly identifies a king named Narmer doing a lot of the things that later historians suggest many's did. The most famous of these archaeological artifacts is known as the Narmer Palette. Let's take a closer look at that now. So, the Narmer Palette is decorative, well, palette, you know? Uh, that was discovered in 1897 at the site of Hierakonpolis in Upper Egypt. Now, a palette's a stone tool, and it's used for the grinding of minerals, often used in cosmetics, right? Think of like a mortar and pestle kind of situation. And you can see here, right, uh, the area where the minerals would actually go, and then they'd be crushed using a stone pestle. The fine decoration on the Narmer palette, though, suggests that it was used more for display and for status rather than for the actual grinding of minerals. Here we're looking at the front, or non-grinding side of the palette. We immediately see a large figure wearing the white crown of Upper Egypt, holding a mace and ready to smite an enemy. We can tell this is Narmer from the Seric above the king, which contains a catfish and chisel, the hieroglyphs that make the name Narmer. The bulls on top symbolize the power of the king, and below the king are two trampled foes. But what ends up making this about the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt? Well, to answer that question, look just to the right of the king's head. And here we see Horus, the god of kingship, depicted in his form as a falcon, having subdued a half-man, half-plant creature. Scholars think that creature represents Lower Egypt because of the reeds that arise out of its back there. And those reeds are a traditional symbol of Lower Egypt and the Nile Delta. So it's not just that Narmer's conquering foes. It's that he, a king of Upper Egypt, is specifically conquering foes from Lower Egypt. The story continues on the back of the palette. Once again, we see the name of Narmer enclosed within the Seric, and we get the bulls that symbolize power presiding over the entire scene. The scenes below are broken into registers. On the top level, we see the king, noteworthy because of his relative size, this time wearing the red crown of Lower Egypt and holding the mace and flail, two of his symbols of power. And just in case it wasn't clear that this was Narmer, they repeat his name in hieroglyphs next to his head. Continuing to the right, we get standard bearers, marching forward with symbols of the king's power. But that's not all. To the right of the standard bearers, we get ten captives over there. And oh boy, it turns out you did not want to lose to King Narmer. The ten captives have each been decapitated. And if that's not bad enough, they've also been castrated, and their dismembered members have been placed atop their decapitated heads. Whew, all that stuff lying between their legs. Nasty stuff there, Narmer. But above the captives, the symbols of possibly, they, they possibly represent the towns from which those captives came, symbolizing the areas that Narmer conquered. Below that register, we get the center of the pallet. Here, two attendants hold back the long necks of two mythical creatures, thought to be half serpent and then half lion or leopard. Not only do scholars think that these symbolize the king's power, but they also symbolize his ability to overcome strong enemies and the interlocking nature of the necks of these creatures which forms the area where the minerals would have actually been ground, may also symbolize the unification, or interlocking, of Upper and Lower Egypt. Now, finally at the bottom, the king is represented as a bull. The symbol of the bull's heads at the top uh, are replaced by the king actually as a bull, trampling his foes at the bottom. And the circle with the square knobs jutting out from it right there 
Well, uh, that represents the enemy's fortified city, which the king has also trampled into submission. So there's no real debate about who this pallet belonged to. It was almost certainly the possession of a king named Narmer. What is hotly debated, however, is the issue of whether the events and iconography represented on the Narmer pallet are indicative of real historical events, or whether they're more representative of kingly power more generally. Basically, does this represent an actual event of the unification of ancient Egypt, or does it just show Narmer's strength and power over a united Egypt? There's still no clear consensus on this. It tends to be that earlier scholars, well, they thought that this represented the actual moment of unification. But more recent scholars interpret it as a symbolic artifact, displaying the king's power over his enemies and over the forces of chaos. So unfortunately, there's like a good chance that we'll never actually have a concrete answer to the question of whether this represents an actual historical event or is something more uh, symbolic of the power of the king. What we do have, however, is more evidence of Narmer's portrayal as conqueror of foes and subduer of disorder. The Narmer mace head, excavated shortly after the pallet at the same site of Hierakompolis, once again portrays Narmer's dominance over the captives of Lower Egypt. We once again see him identified by his catfish and chisel Sarek, and then he's portrayed sitting on a throne wearing the red crown and holding the royal flail. Bound captives are led in from the right, while standard bearers occupy the top of the scene. The enclosure, with a calf and a bull, represent the lower Egyptian capital of Bhutto, which Narmer possibly conquered during the unification process. Now, one of the crazy things here is that the Narmer mace head lists the amount of booty taken from this event, perhaps suggesting that it was indeed an actual historical event. So we get, for example, 400,000 cattle. We get 1.4 million goats. And to top it all off, we've got 120,000 captives listed in the bottom of the register scene. So was Narmer the same person as Manitho's Menes? The argument in favor of this normally goes that the events depicted on the Narmer palette and upon the mace head and on the inscriptions throughout Egypt and the Sinai correspond to the idea of Menes unification of Egypt. And the difference in names can be explained by the different types of names that kings use. Narmer would have been the Horus name, adopted upon taking power, and Menes would have been the Sejin B name, which he was given at birth. Now, other scholars suggest that Menes should be linked with an entirely different king, one by the name of Hor Aha, who succeeded Narmer as king of Egypt. Now, supporters of the Hor Aha point of view, uh, they point to an ivory label that shows the Sarek of Hor Aha alongside uh, the symbol of King Menes, which looks like a chessboard with some cones on top of it. Not to be outdone, Supporters of Narmer as the same person as Menes point towards an ancient seal which produces alternating serics of Narmer with chessboards of Menes. For them, this seal is representing both the names of the same king, and would thus imply that Narmer and Menes are indeed the same person. Supporters of Aha aren't done yet, though. They've analyzed other seals from the same time. And just for some background info here, these little seals, they're like little carved stone artifacts. And they would have been used to show something uh, hasn't been tampered with, right? So it's like sealing a letter, and then you put the seal over it to show that nobody's messed with it. And they say that this alternating format of the Narmer Sarek and the Menes chessboard is actually what you would get. It's what you would expect 
from a king-prince relationship rather than a king-king relationship, suggesting that Narmer is the father of Menes, who would then be associated with, of course, poor Aha. So what do we make of all this? Well, far more recent evidence found at Abydos in the last few decades has produced several king lists. And each of these king lists starts with Narmer as the first king of Egypt, suggesting that he is indeed Manitho's Menes. While it's impossible to tell, my money is on the fact that Narmer and Menes are indeed the same person, although there's no way of knowing for sure. But what we can take away from all this is the sheer amount of information we can glean from archaeological artifacts. Think of all the messages that are conveyed by the Narmer palette and the Narmer macehead, all with an incredibly limited set of words. The kings use symbols like maces and palettes to convey their power and their ability to subdue chaos. And as archaeologists, our job, right? is to decipher exactly what these artifacts are trying to say. So sometimes an artifact really can say a thousand words, although exactly which words may be up for debate. Just a couple lessons you can take away from King Narmer, Unifier of Egypt. 